What's up, y'all? It's your boy, Anthony D. Mays, and today I am doing my very first reaction video ever. And what better video to start off with than the Google example interview from 2016? I know you're excited, right? I've been wanting to do this video for a long time and I finally have the opportunity. Plus, I left Google not too long ago, so I get to say what I wanna say and do what I wanna do. I want to show you how these tips that I've been giving you over the years actually show up in a realistic interview situation. So we're gonna talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly, and hopefully by the end of this video, you'll have a good idea for how to actually use the advice that I've given you around problem solving, around brainstorming, around thinking out loud. You're gonna see all of that illuminated here, um, and we're gonna talk about some of the stuff that's maybe a little unrealistic, and just kind of give you some insight from someone who's been on both sides of the interviewing table so that you understand how you need to tackle your interview, whether you're doing it at a company like Google or another fame company or wherever, all right? So, let's get to it. Don't care for the music already. There won't be music in the real interview. Hi, probably. I'm Edgar and I'm a software engineer at Google. Hi, I'm Becky and I'm a software engineer at Google. So Edgar, the question I'm going to give you today is, uh, I'm gonna give you a collection of numbers and I need you to take this collection of numbers and find a matching pair that is equal to a, a sum that I give you as well. Okay. So for example, the co collection of numbers could be one, two, three, and nine. And the sum that I'm looking for is eight. Okay. And then another example, just for another set of numbers, could be a one, a two, a four, and a four, and then again, the sum that I'm looking for is eight. So in this... All right, so I wanna pause right here because um, one of the things that um, you see here is that the interviewer, after they give you the question, they may actually have a couple of, of examples ready to go. Now, I always tell my candidates, if your interviewer doesn't give you an example, you make sure to come up with examples on your own. But if your interviewer does give you an example or gives you multiple examples, you should use that as a time to collect more information on the problem that you're trying to solve. So in this case, the interviewer has given you uh, a couple of examples. You should figure out why they gave you those examples and what information those examples can convey about the problem that you need to solve or the constraints around the problem, right? So let's let's see how uh, the candidate deals with these examples. Okay, there, I, I guess uh, what I'm trying to figure out is, um, you're looking for a pair of numbers that, that add up to eight. Yes. Right? So in this case, there isn't a pair of numbers that add up to eight. That is true in okay. this example. And in this case, it is because the four and four add up to eight. Correct. Okay, yes. so this is this would be like a no, and this is it. yes. Okay? Yes, you ultimately... So I love how um, the candidate here is um, actually coming up with the output of the algorithm um, based upon these examples, right? So the interviewer gave, provided the inputs and the candidate came up with the examples based upon their understanding of the question. I think that that was a, a great thing to do. When you're coming up with examples, you need to concern yourself with both the input and the output. Um, the only thing that I would do different is instead of saying uh, no or yes, I would probably just write true or false because at this point, I'm pretty sure that my algorithm should return a Boolean. But if I weren't sure about that, I would explicitly ask that question or um, state that assumption, right? Okay, I assume that my method should return a Boolean. Is that fair? And then get the feedback from the interviewer at that point. But yeah, no, nevertheless, good job here. Okay, so how are these numbers given? Uh, can I assume that they're kind of like in memory, um, an array or something? Yeah, they're in memory. You I love that. I love that the uh, candidate didn't assume that all of the input fit in memory. And I know that some people can be nervous about asking whether all the input fits in memory because what if the interviewer says no? Okay, well now I need to think about how this works across multiple machines or I need to figure out how to split up the input or shard it in such a way that I can read just parts of the input at a time. 
And that can be scary for, for folks, but I think it demonstrates uh, a good awareness when you ask whether or not the input fits in memory. One other thing that I would do here is I would um, kind of just express my observations. Like in both of these examples, you can see that the inputs are sorted. And I would ask if the inputs are always gonna be sorted or not. But I think I would get more uh, specific uh, in terms of like, you know, is it is it sorted? Does it fit in memory? You know, are there gonna be integers, et cetera, et cetera. You go with an array. You can also assume that they're, in, that they're ordered in sending order. Okay, oh, interesting, okay. Uh oh, so that's interesting. The interviewer actually tells the candidate that the input is sorted. So um, the interviewer volunteered the information. I think if I were in the interviewer situation, I actually wouldn't volunteer that. I would wait for the candidate to ask. And if we get to a point where I realize that maybe the candidate isn't gonna ask, then perhaps I would reveal it um, at that time. Or maybe, you know, if I were the candidate, I would come up with an example where the arrays aren't sorted and then let the interviewer correct me if I'm uh, wrong in that assumption. So that's another way that I might uh, discover that information if I don't just ask the question up front. Just be aware of the fact that not all interviewers are gonna be willing to just give up that information. They're gonna wanna see you ask questions to uncover that, to, to figure out if you know how to deal with ambiguity in the right way. Um, so how about repeating elements? Can I assume that there will be, like for instance here, uh, what if I, I guess, what, what if I didn't have that four? Mm. Could I use like the four and the four to get that eight? You can't repeat the same element at the same index twice, but certainly the same number may appear twice. Like okay, you okay, so. Like so I love what the candidate did here. The, the candidate doesn't just take the examples that the interviewer gave. He actually does a good job of modifying to explore how they might be malleable. And I think it's uh, also interesting too, um, that the interviewer chose to use a specific example containing duplicate numbers. In this situation, I feel like the interviewer was trying to hint to the candidate that there might be some special restriction around how you deal with duplicate numbers or how you deal with adding um, values to themselves to come up with the output. So I think this is just a great job on uh, the candidate's part to spot this and to ask the question and to explore this um, to make sure that um, that that use case is valid or invalid like that would be, would be a yes uh, how about these numbers are they integers or are they floating point or you could assume they're all great question about data types okay. uh, negative great question positives uh negatives could happen okay cool so the candidate asks whether there can be negative values um, and the interviewer here just says um yeah there can be negatives i think one thing that i would ask or that i've been asking the interview is does it matter and uh, I think that's a more interesting question for me to ask as an interviewer, because that gets you thinking as a candidate, it doesn't really matter if the values are negative or not. So, well, the first, the simplest solution, of course, is just comparing every single possible pair. Uh, so I could just have two for loops, one scanning the whole thing, and then the second one starting from, let's say you have the I loop and then the J loop starting from I plus one so that I don't repeat the same value. Mm -hmm. And just testing all of them, if the sum is equal to the... I love how the candidate sum. is already thinking in code. Uh, Notice that um, coming up with this uh, brute force solution is great. Uh, very quickly, the candidate describes exactly what they would do. You can tell they're already kind of seeing the code work out. This comes from, I think, someone who's really studied uh, and practiced coding quite a bit, that it's easy for them to articulate their thoughts into code. So I'm already, as an interviewer, sensing that they're not gonna have a problem getting a solution uh, written out or typed out or wherever that may be, because they're already starting to express their thoughts in the form of code, which I think is great. One thing that uh, the candidate hasn't done yet, um, and I think I find this kind of interesting, I would be taking notes at this point. I would have written down those assumptions uh, that I've just verified, that they're gonna be integers, that they're gonna be sorted, um, that there may be negative values, that everything fits in memory. I would actually make little notes on the whiteboard just so I don't have to keep that in my head. I mean, that's obviously not very uh, efficient, but that's, that would be like a, a way to solve it. That would work. Uh, it certainly would be time consuming, I think, as yes. far as obstacles is concerned. So is there any kind of example that could yeah. be a little bit faster? Yeah, I think that that would be quadratic. So.
the interviewer here is giving the candidate feedback that their solution might be inefficient um, or that it is inefficient. And the interviewer here is choosing to not just let the interviewer um, go and implement the naive solution. Um, for me, I don't generally have a problem with it, depending upon the question. And I think for something like this, I would let the candidate totally go with the naive solution and then maybe do the analysis later. One of the things that I talk about as a coach is I want you to brainstorm up front before you implement any solution. What I would have done is say, okay, well, I want to do the two loop strategy and that's going to be big O of N squared. And then I would start thinking about, okay, well, well, how can I do better? One question that you should always be ready to answer is what's the best I can do in this situation? What's the best I can do for something like this, I know that I have to look at all the values at least once. And I would hope that I wouldn't need to do it more than once. So to me, that says that I want my algorithm to optimally run in big O of end time or linear time. Like I just know that from looking at the problem as described so far. So if I'm coming up with a solution, um, as the candidate does, that's big O of n squared, like there's nothing wrong with that but my intuition immediately after that is gonna to want to be to figure out um, how I might be able to optimize that using some different strategies. And I'm gonna do that before I implement the naive solution. Better than quadratic. Uh, well, since it's sorted, so okay, I, I, I guess I need to figure out when I have a number, what I'm looking for is if, if there's another number that sounds to eight. So, so if I have a one, what I need to figure out is if there's a seven somewhere in the in the um, array. And if that's the case, if it's sorted, then I can just do binary search. Uh, I guess if I go here and I binary search for a seven, mm -hmm. um, then I go here and I binary search for a six, which is the complement of that. And when I go here, I binary search for a five. And in the end, I just don't do anything. And so in this case, I would solve it like binary that. search can come uh, in so clutch. So that's a bit better you. than quadratic. Know I know that guess. binary search. Binary search is, is a log uh, algorithm in a sorted list. Mm -hmm. um, also a good answer. OK. But um, still kind of slow. So again, the candidate has come up with another solution that relies on binary search. And this is great uh, because the candidate understands, they start to think about this as a searching problem. Sometimes I, I ask candidates to think about whether their problem is a sorting problem or a searching problem. In this case, um, the problem is a searching problem because you're trying to find two values that add up to some sum and you're just gonna return whether it exists or not. So that's a, a searching problem. And anytime you're thinking about search, my mind always goes to binary search because there aren't a lot of searching algorithms. Um, there are at least not a lot that I studied. So binary search is just the first thing that intuitively comes to mind. So yeah, I would be thinking about how I can apply binary search in this situation because it's so effective and so common as a pattern. Notice that the candidate is immediately able to tell you what the big O runtime of binary search is because they know their algorithms and data structures well enough and they know the big O associated with those algorithms and data structures that they don't really have to struggle with that. They also understand that a, a logarithmic time algorithm, big O of log base two of n or big O of log n, they know that that's gonna be better than linear time, which is big O of n. And so when you're studying big O, you need to understand how the values relate to each other so that you can um, know whether using one algorithm is gonna give you a better performance than the other. Uh, now, he says that binary search is logarithmic, and I, I totally get that. Here's the problem, is that the algorithm that he'd implement wouldn't actually be logarithmic. It would be uh, technically in log n, because for every value in the array, he's gonna do a binary search um, that's log n. Um, it's, it, it, and depending upon how he implements it, it might not be quite um, n times log n. Um, you can do some things to optimize that a little bit. Okay. So what if you took a look at, instead of going a binary search, which is unidirectional, what if you started with a pair of numbers to begin with? Okay. And then worked your way sort of inward from there? Uh, let's see. So if I, okay, let me try to bound this thing. That's a pretty big hint. So the, the largest possible sum, I guess, uh, would be the last two values. 
That would be the largest possible sum. And yeah. the smallest possible sum would be the, the two smallest, right? right? So so anything in between. Um, ah, okay. So the range of the possible values is that, right? So there's nothing that is probably small. There's nothing that can be smaller than this value. Right. There's nothing that can be larger than that value. And you have somewhere so, to move from. Uh, that's okay. So if this sum is 10 in this case, it's too large. Mm -hmm. So I need to find a smaller sum. So I could just sort of move this one over here. And if that is too small now, then I need to move that one over there. Okay, so I can I think I can just do it with with that in a in a linear solution. Just moving at each iteration, I either move the high one lower mm -hmm. if I am if my pair is too large, mm -hmm. and I move my lower higher if my pair is too small. And I end whenever I either find two, like uh, in this case, I, I either find a pair mm -hmm. that adds up to eight, mm -hmm. or whenever they cross. So at every, at every point I'm moving one of them, so they would have to at least cross, and I move exactly one, so that means that it's linear. Yeah, so that, that would be a, a, a way of solving that problem. Okay, so notice here how the candidate has figured out that by introducing a second pointer into the mix, they can do some interesting things, um, you know, iterating from either side of the array to uh, test combinations of different values. And I think that that's an important insight and great intuition on the candidate's part. When you're working with data structures like arrays, linked lists, um, doubly linked lists, um, maybe even trees or certain kinds of graphs, introducing another pointer into the mix uh, can help you do things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Certainly the, the two loops example or the two loop strategy that the candidate initially employed would effectively be using two pointers, an I pointer and a J pointer, if I can uh, use that term that way. Having pointers go from either side of the array and then kind of meeting towards the middle is a great strategy on the candidate's part. And, you know, again, this was the, the candidate got here because the interviewer made the suggestion and dropped the hint. And so one of the things that you have to understand is that your interviewer is there to help you and they're gonna give you information depending upon how they feel um, about how you're doing to help you along. So there's nothing wrong with, with getting hints, taking hints. It's still pretty clear to me that the candidate is in charge and doing the thinking and thinking out loud. I think in a real interview, I wouldn't have given that hint away as early as, um, as they did. There's a great hint and the candidate did a fantastic job of picking up on that and responding accordingly. Okay, so in the binary search case, I was doing log for finding, but I had to repeat that for every element. So that was an n log n solution. In this case, I just need to do that moving, scanning the one time. So it's a linear solution. So that's that's faster. Right, right. Okay. We could get to coding it, but before we, before we do that, maybe you could explain. So you, you explained it in a non-working example. Maybe you could follow through that same process in a working Okay, example. yeah. So here I would start with this mm -hmm. and that, right? So it's five, it's smaller than eight. So I move this one here. So that's six, that's smaller than eight. Mm -hmm. So I go here and then that's eight. So that's true and I return. Excellent. Yeah, I think that would work. Okay, so what coding language would you prefer to, to do this in? Um, I, I prefer C++, if that's okay. C++ works. Okay. Right, go for it. Ah, perfect. My man, Let's see. C++. So, okay. Uh, see, that whiteboard's too small. Now I realize on, that I haven't figured out what I need to return. I mean, this is Google. So, you can't afford bigger the whiteboards pair, than that. The indices of the pair, or whether I just found it or not. So, uh, for the purposes of the example, we'll go with whether you found it or not. But let's say you were going to return the pair. How could that become a problem okay. if there was no pair? So, I mean, building the pair would be easy, right? Mm -hmm. So, I, I would just return the pair. If I didn't find it, then I would need to return some sort of like Boolean. So, I guess I could make a data structure that has a Boolean that denotes whether the pair is valid or not. Mm -hmm. Like, has, mm -hmm. has it been found? So, yeah. like, a, like a bool found and then a pair uh, values or something like that. And combine wrapped, those together. Yeah. And then this is the thing that you return. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not very elegant, but it's workable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Rather than going with a custom object, maybe we'll just return a, a boolean then. Okay, that, that makes it a lot easier, yes. Yeah, I like this. So there are a couple of things that you could do in this situation. One would be you return uh, the pair of indices, uh, maybe as an array, uh, as a pair uh, in the form of a, just an array that has two elements. Uh, that would totally work or you could use a data structure that has you know value one value two and an object or some kind of a struct that would be fair uh, but the issue here is that if you don't find a valid pair are you just going to return null are you going to return undefined or empty or something of that nature that would probably not be a good idea from an api design perspective um, so you might choose to throw an exception uh, but that also feels kind of messy too there is a number of options that you can uh, pick here. And I think that it's fine for the candidate cho to choose any one of those options. What's important is that they explain why they chose that and what the upsides and downsides are. Good to know that you thought about what might, you might have to do if there is no viable result. Yeah, mm -hmm. I just said that. Okay, so let's just call it pass pair with sum, I guess. Let's, sure. uh, it's a pretty good and method so, name. I like that it's verbose. I, I'm okay just receiving whatever. I would like to receive it as a vector, say. Vector is fine, yeah, sure. And we said ints are fine. Ints are fine. Glad uh, that you checked with the interviewer. It's my data. Work. And then I have an int, yeah, which is my C++. Mm -hmm. Okay, so like I said, I want sort of an int, uh, my low, which is zero. Then my high, which is uh, the data size minus one. And then what I'm gonna do is while these are, while, while, while my low is strictly lower than my high, mm -hmm. okay, as soon as they are touching, then I know that I can't guarantee that they're different, so that, that's where I should stop. Okay, my, well, my low is less than my high. And this also solves the problem of what happens if this is empty. Because then if this is empty, this would be a minus one, mm -hmm. and then that would be violated, so I would never enter and access any of the value. So that's... I love how my dude is thinking about those exception cases. Um, number one, the candidate's doing a great job of just you know, writing out code quickly and effortlessly, you can tell that they're not having to think about um, a lot in order to articulate what they're thinking. It, it flows very naturally, very quickly. Uh, the, the implementation part of the interview process should be the easiest part. Once you know what problem you need to solve, once you've done the brainstorming, uh, once you've, you've done the big analysis and stuff like that, when it comes time to implement, that should be the easiest, most straightforward, most simple part. So if you struggle with just writing code, uh, you're gonna have a big problem when it comes to um, doing technical interviews like this. So make sure that you know how, you know, where the curly braces go, make sure that you understand loop uh, structures and conditionals, make sure that you understand um, what idiomatic code looks like for your language. Uh, so this is all, pretty good um I, I think this candidate is doing excellent so far that's fine so while low is less than high i guess if my data at low plus my data at high is the same as my target uh, my target which is called sum mm -hmm. then i have found it that's it, that's my pair. And here's where I would construct that pair if I needed to return it. Mm -hmm. But like you say, for now, I can just return true. Now, I hate this music. if this is larger than sum, and this is lower than sum, so I think I'm better than just doing it three times. I'm just gonna store it in a, in a variable, uh, which is my S is that and then say if s is my sum, then return true. It's a good refactor. It's very good. Okay, I'm gonna and, stop you right there. Okay. Excellent solution. I see what you're getting at here. 
But now I'm going to throw a little wrench into the mix for you. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> hmm. I can no longer guarantee for you that the numbers in this collection are sorted. Okay, so... You have to think of a different way to, s to compare them against each other. Now. I mean, it... So I think that this is super interesting. Um, and I assume that they're doing it for time uh, because this is a short, um, short video. I would not want to interrupt a candidate in the middle of them implementing their solution to throw a wrench in and make them do something different. And, and here's why. I'd wanna see you write a fully working solution on your own um, at least once. And I think the risk of interrupting a candidate is that they could have well been on their way to do that, but now they don't have the opportunity because you've thrown a wrench in the thing. So for me, that that's not my preference. But it also, I think, means that the interviewer feels confident enough in how the candidate is doing that they know that they could do that. Um, like at this point, it's it's pretty clear to me that this candidate is, knows their stuff. They know how to write good, clean code. They're making good decisions um, throughout. I wouldn't have a problem interrupting in this case if I had to, to move the candidate along. If your interviewer does kind of stop you in your tracks as you're doing things uh, and tries to move you along, that that's probably a good thing. It means that they probably have confidence in you and, and what you're accomplishing and, and just kind of want to take it up a notch. One thing that I talk about um, is that, you know, I have a, a process for going through um, interview questions and I talk about the six step, pro six step problem solving process. I'll include a link in the video description uh, so that you can have access to that. It's important to understand that you need to be flexible and nimble. You need to be able to go where the interviewer wants you to go. So if you got to step out of step five in order to go back to step two or step three, do that. Or if you get stuck, you might have to go back and ask some additional questions uh, or you might have to brainstorm some more. So don't be, you wanna know your problem solving process well enough that if you're changing directions in the interview, you can easily uh, figure out where you need to be and then progress from there. So uh, I think it's great that the, um, it seems, well, we'll see how the candidate does. I don't, sus does, I don't suspect they'll have a problem. First thing I Dudes. do is just sort, of course then I, I solve this problem the sure, same way, right? Sure. So that would be still an n log n solution. It would. Which would mm. be like the same as, as the, the binary search yeah. as well. But it's too you want, for Google. Okay, so you want no, faster yeah. than that, okay. <laughs> if you're keeping count, like the candidate has already come up with four different ways to solve the problem, um, which is fantastic. I, I love when candidates are able to brainstorm effectively and come up with multiple solutions to a problem. Um, again, you see that this candidate has no problem understanding the big O, right? If I have to sort it, it's going to be in login time. And then, you know, assuming that you stay with the same linear approach of using the two iterators come from either side, that's an additional um, in big O of n amount of time, big O of n login plus another n. It just boils down to big O of n login, right? Um, and you see that um, the interviewer has no objections. And still, this. it's pushing the candidate to go faster. If I go back to this idea of when I look at a number, what I need to figure out is if the complement is in the rest. The uh, complement meaning? Uh, the, yeah. The, yeah, the eight minus this value, right? right. So in this case, when I have the one, mm -hmm. I need to figure out if seven is in the rest. Yes. Okay. If I cannot sort and searching that will be linear, so that's not a very good idea. Mm -hmm. But maybe I can do it the other way around. So I build it up little by little. And instead of just sort of asking a blanket, is there anywhere? I just ask, have I seen it in the past? So for instance, if I'm here, what I need to find out is if I have seen eight minus three. Have I seen five in the past? That would work. Um, so you'd have to store five. Or I guess it's the same, but I could be storing the complements. And I just ask, have I seen three as a complement of anything of the things before. Yeah. Sort of like I, I insert a seven when I see a one. Sure. I insert a six if I see a two. You insert the complement. And then, yes, I insert the complement. And then when I get here, I ask, is, the, is this the complement of anything I have seen in right. the past? Right. So I can do, I can use a data structure that is very good for, for lookups. Okay. Right. So I can do something like a hash table, which has like a constant time lookup. Um, hash table though. Hash you table. Care. Do you need a key in this case? I, I guess I don't need a, I mean, I just need. This is again, great intuition on the candidate's part. 
No wonder they're Googler. One of the techniques that I talked to Candace about when it comes to brainstorming and figuring out how to make things more optimal is thinking about how to use more space. So if you wanna make your algorithm go fast, you generally need to use more space. And that generally means introducing a new data structure in order to, um, to use space effectively. And so the candidate very quickly figures out like, oh yeah, I need to look up specific elements quickly. It says uh, hash table, which is the great intuition. You may not have caught this. The candidate said that look up in a hash table is like constant time. I think that the candidate was, the candidate didn't actually say this, but if you take a look at bigocheatsheet.com, you'll notice that look at, uh, looking up values in a hash table isn't big O of one. It's not actually constant time. The average time complexity for looking up from a hash table is constant time. That's big O of one. You don't really have to worry about it. It's probably gonna be constant time, but it's not guaranteed to be. Um, you can't actually say that because you may have a horrible hash and you may have a lot of collisions in your hash table. So uh, number one, never implement your own uh, hashing algorithm because you don't need to do that. But number two, uh, when you're talking about the runtime for looking up things in a hash table, be aware that on average is constant time. So, you know, we can say that, you know, looking up a value in a hash table is like constant time. We can't say that it's actually big O of one because it's not actually big O of one, it's big O of N. So just one of those things you wanna be careful about when you're talking about um, the runtime complexity of the operations in a hash table. The values, the, 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 the elements, I don't, I don't actually want to store any payload. So yeah, I guess a hash set would be the, the thing to do. So I hash set all of the complements and then I look for them. I, I need to be careful though. Uh, how am I gonna deal with the case of uh, repeated mm -hmm. elements? Uh, so I don't want to be able to say, oh, I have a four. Yes, of course I have a four, I'm done. Right. I, if, if I have this, mm -hmm. I have a four, I'd have it, so I'm done. That would be a wrong solution. Mm -hmm. mm, I guess I need to be careful there. So, okay, <laughs> okay, okay. So here's an idea. I only look for things, so when I'm here, I only look for things that I have seen before. So as long as I check before I insert things, mm -hmm. that should work. Very smart. And then when I Very add smart. it here, this one will find that because it's in the previous one. So I, I think that works, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, this is one of those reasons why I highly encourage my candidates to come up with examples before they code, because you see in this case, the candidate is working with the real example, illustrating what the code is going to do so that he has a clear understanding of where the pointers need to go and how he's going to add things to the map, et cetera, et cetera. I think this is great strategy on the candidate's part uh, because it makes it clear both to them as the candidate and to the interviewer what the code is going to do. Like I can already visualize this code and what it looks like. I already see that the candidate is thinking preemptively about some of those uh, uh, border conditions and, and tackling all that. Great candidates tend to do this. They know how to use examples effectively and to visualize what they're going to do before they do it. This is part of what it means to think out loud. Um, Let's code it. Okay, very well. <laughs> so let's see. Uh, That's one thing that I definitely want to hear. I want to hear my interviewer say, let's code it, right? Uh, because the interviewer at that point is saying, yes, you've done, done a good job of explaining what you want to do. Now let's see it in real code. So like I was saying, bool of pass uh, pair with some with my, oh, okay, can I just like uh, my vec, I mean, it's a const vector <laughs> of end uh, data. Yeah, and at this point, the interviewer has seen some. the candidate write okay. this code before, so they're totally fine so with the a candidate doing set, some so abbreviation. C++, that's an unordered set. Mm. Of integers still. And I'm gonna call it complements. Uh, well, I don't wanna write complements all the time, so I'm just gonna call it comp Sounds and good. say these are the complements. It's good that the candidate knows um, I see what, whatever I how the data structure actually looks the sum. Yep. in their target language. And so as I said, I just need to be building it up little by little. So I do a for uh, my int 
uh, value. I get the blue screen. Oh, for it's, each of the values in the they data. They probably have this blue mm -hmm. screen because the I am going whiteboard to is too small and the check, can is going to write below and the then insert. screen. So if my complement, so I check if I have seen it. First, yeah. Yeah, I would have just called I the variable complements. Have seen it, so that means if it's not in the end. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I guess. Then that's it. Um, that should be a return true. Because this current element and something that I have seen in the past add up to the sum. Mm -hmm. So obviously it depends on what I've been inserting. So that's what I'm going to do here. My complements is going to be inserting. I, I, I don't remember. I think it's add for an unordered set, but there's Probably. there's something. Um, it's either right. the candidate isn't actually sure what the method is for adding values to the set, um, and if you look, neither was the uh, interviewer, or the interviewer is maybe pretending not to know. They may very well know, but they're just pretending not to know. Uh, but the candidate uses good intuition uh, because uh, you know if you've studied that data structure, you should know. You should have a good intuition about what the method name might be based upon uh, your understanding of that. So, I, you know, I like that here. Uh, the candidate doesn't actually know and the interviewer is claiming not to know what the name of the method is, but still good intuition. I would not dock you if you um, used add versus um, set versus, um, I don't know, push. Um, I, we might be stretching if you called it push, but um, you know, I, I think I'd be fine with any of those names because those are, I think, reasonable synonyms for what the method does. So, um, you know, or insert, insert would also be fine with me. Add or insert or something, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I add not the value, but the complement, like I said. So I do the sum minus value. I feel like I probably need to uh, go through an example, but anyway, mm. to make sure that this is correct. Uh, About to test the code. Test yourself before you wreck I yourself. I think that's it. Um, okay. Let me let me go through through some examples to, to make sure. I'm gonna uh, yes. So okay. That's my examples. So I have a, I have a set. My my complements is a set, which starts empty. I'm going to run through both. Uh, they're kind of the same at the beginning, so mm -hmm. that should be fine. Uh, so I have nothing in. It's going to turn his brain I into a compiler. I check for my first value, which is a one. Mm -hmm. I don't find anything, obviously. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I add eight minus one. So I add a seven here. Okay, so now I have a seven. Um, then I go for the next one, two. I look for whether there's a two there. Mm -hmm. No, there isn't. But if I had had a six here, Adding the complement would have find the two, so that would that would be good. So that that makes sense. Okay, the seven it's not there, so I just add now the six, mm -hmm. and here's where they start to diverge. Uh, the next case is I get a three. Have I seen a three? No. Well, uh, have I seen the complement of a three? No. Mm -hmm. So I just shove in the three. Mm -hmm. uh, that three is complement. Good point. Yeah, and then the last one, no, I have not, uh, there's no nine here, so it would correctly return false. Right. Now, what about the other one? The other case, I get a four. I have not seen a, uh, the complement of four, so I put the four in. Okay. Because it's eight minus four is four. Mm -hmm. And then, when I get to this one, I have found it, so I correctly return true. Value is equal to complement. Yeah, yeah. So the value would be four. Mm -hmm. I look here in my complements and I do find it, so I return true. Okay, so that works. Uh, what happens with an empty? Uh, the empty one should never return true because Good. you don't have a pair, so mm -hmm. that's fine. Mm -hmm. You have only one thing. Good you work never testing would compare again. So that's condition. fine. So it seems like that that works. Uh, there is one issue. This could underflow, so. Mm. Um, okay, let's not worry about that. So I oh, think I is, love that. I love that the candidate was thinking about overflow and underflow. That That's so smart. If you get, um, so you, you might very well get into a situation uh, of underflow where, you know, your values are, um, you know, uh, let's say integer min minus integer max, something, well, integer min minus anything. 
um, is going to give you an underflow. And what that means is, is that the number is so low that it actually can't be represented by an integer in this case. Um, I'm guessing that a C++ integer is going to be a 32 bit integer, uh, which means that you get 31 bits um, of representation plus that last bit to represent the sign of the number. So uh, you might uh, get into a situation where you want to compute a value that's lower than integer minimum, and that's going to be a problem. The candidate is thinking about that uh, because he knows he's doing arithmetic here, and that could get into that situation. It, you know, if I'm the interviewer, I'm absolutely going to write in my notes that the inter that the uh, candidate identified a potential underflow condition uh, correctly, and so I love that the candidate was thinking about that and treated it as a as a bug. Uh, but, you know, in this case, the interviewer just says, you don't have to worry about it. Like, we're not going to get in that situation and that's all good. So uh, just well done. So, uh, the right solution. Um, so it's linear because I am doing constant amount of work. The lookup is constant. Adding is constant for a, an ordered set. Mm -hmm. And I do it for all of the values in the input. So that's linear. And the memory is, I guess, linear as well because the worst case scenario, I have added all of them. I love that he's also talking about Would not just the time complexity, but the space complexity too. Good. In this collection? Okay, so let's see. Um, so, so just when you thought it was just when you thought it was over, interviewer has to throw one more thing in there. And notice that across this interview, it's a multi-phase thing, right? Um, we started off with. Um, the numbers are, are sorted and you just need to figure out whether a pair exists or not. And now we're talking about, well, what if there are 10 million numbers or 10 billion numbers or however um, the interviewer just mentioned. Remember that companies like Google and Amazon and Twitter are, are just working at massive scale and they want to know that you can think about uh, uh, problems at scale and uh, understand how to write code that works in a distributed system environment. And so it's completely unsurprising to me that the interviewer would ask that question. It's a question that I think is great to ask if the candidate has made uh, it sufficiently far into the problem that we can talk about that. If the input is large, does it still fit in memory or? Probably not at this point. Okay, so if it doesn't fit in memory, what I can do, okay, so is the range of these values limited in some way. Um, you can assume that okay. they might be, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So if this, it, it, if my set fits in memory, mm -hmm. but my whole input doesn't fit in memory, mm -hmm. then I can just sort of process it in chunks, right? Okay, okay. Uh, I chunk it and I just put it in a set and I accumulate it in a set. Mm -hmm. uh, if we can do it in parallel, mm -hmm. then it's kind of the same thing, right? So now you have mm. multiple computers, each one produ uh, processing each bit of it, of the input, each one producing a um, set of complements that this bit has seen, mm -hmm. and we just sort of merge them. Um, I think we have enough computers, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the merging would be a bit tricky because we want to make sure that again we don't we don't sort of look for the thing that we have put in so by the way a lot of times with um, interview questions like this when you're talking about scalability and uh, processing things with multiple machines it's the same answer it's process stuff in chunks combine it later i mean that's 99 percent of the time if you just said something to that effect you'd be really close to uh, the actual solution so just get used to thinking about how you would uh, process um, uh, subparts of the input or subsets of the input and then combine intermediate results later on. Uh, this is also why you should understand things like MapReduce um, as a pattern uh, for, for um, dealing with uh, large amounts of data at scale um, and other kinds of patterns um, similar to that. So, yep, the, this, this, this canon has been around the block a couple of times. Uh... I guess as long as each individual computer is testing this in the right order, mm -hmm. when we merge them, mm -hmm. now we can say, oh, well, those two are, are, are correctly. Um, so if I have a four in one computer and a four in the other computer, when I merge them, I would need to be careful that, that I reconcile them. Yeah. But other than that, I think that would be the only consideration. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Great job.
Cool. Well, I really hope that you enjoyed this video. Hopefully you got a lot of value out of this. Like I said, I've got articles on my website at anthonydmaze.com. You can check those out. Um, that provides you know you free information and advice on how to navigate technical interviews of the likes that you might encounter at a Google, Amazon, Twitter, Meta, wherever. So make sure uh, to uh, check those out. Also follow me on Twitter uh, and LinkedIn. I'm always uh, trying to put information out there that's going to help you. So hey, if you enjoyed this video, give it a like. I'd appreciate that. Uh, you can follow me on YouTube where I plan to put out a whole lot more useful information to help you along in your tech journey. Until next time, I'm Anthony D. Mays. Peace.